Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here this morning. 2018, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. If there's ever a people who had the right to rejoice and the honor of being able to rejoice, it certainly would be a person who has given their life to uh, Jesus Christ. And as we think about this other passage, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As we look into 2018, God is going to place before us a number of challenges as well as opportunities to do some incredible things for the Lord. And so I just pray that uh, and ask you to be praying that God will be a blessing to us as individual Christians as well as to our, our congregation. Uh, last week, you might recall that as we ended the end of uh, 2017, uh, I began a new series of lessons called Charting a Path Forward. You might recall that we began by talking about vision. As we look into the future, well, no one really knows what the future is about. There's some fear, there's some intrepidation, but at the same time, there's a sense of, of freshness and excitement about what can be and what should be as uh, God's people and so forth. And so there is a vision that is out before us. You might recall I said to you that vision means to have an act of power of anticipating that which may or could, could come. That we look brightly into the future and know that great things can come our way as followers of, of Jesus Christ. And so this morning I want to talk to you about a principle that I think will help us, help us to chart our path forward as believers in uh, Jesus Christ. The date is uh, Sunday, December the 7th, 1941. On that morning, everyone would probably wake up from a, a normal evening of rest uh, like they had every other day. But on this particular day, it would be a completely different day altogether. In American history, it will go down as a date that would live in infamy. Of course, we're talking about the day in which over 200 Japanese aircraft around 2.55 a.m. local time in Hawaii attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was an interesting place. It was known as the Gibraltar of the Pacific. They thought it was absolutely untouchable. But in a raid that lasted for a little bit over an hour or so, it almost completely decimated the Pacific fleet. 3,800 or 3,800 3, men were, were killed. Over 200 aircraft on the ground were destroyed. Battleships, cruisers, boats littered the harbor way. It was a terrible scene in so many ways. It was so terrible that it brought uh, the United States into World War II. On that same day that that happened, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz was at a concert in Washington, D.C. in the evening. He received a page that he had a phone call. He got up and he went to the phone, and when he got on the other end of the phone, he found out that the president, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was calling him and told him that he was now going to be the commander over the Pacific fleet. Nimitz was a man who was quite visionary in his time. He began to make plans and put together a staff for going to uh, uh, Hawaii and began to make plans for how they were going to address the problem that had occurred in, in the Pacific uh, there. On, the Chris, on Christmas Eve of that uh, of that year, 1941, he arrived in Pearl Harbor. On Christmas Day, he got a boat, and the boat was to take him on a tour around the uh, harbor itself. As he got out and began to make his way along with his houndsmen and so forth, they were all devastated. In, in Nemesis's book, he said these words, there was such despair and dejection and defeat you would have thought that we had already lost the war to the Japanese and so forth. And so he began to uh, make his tour through the harbor and so forth and all the destruction that was, was there. When he finished up the, 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 the tour and went back to the dock and so forth, the young helmsman asked the admiral, he says, Admiral Nimitz, he goes, what do you think about all this destruction that is around? It's, it's absolutely terrible, isn't it? And, and, and Nimitz respi replied to him in a way that was shocking to those who could hear his, his voice. He said these words, The Japanese made three mistakes a, a, an attack force could ever make, or God was taking care of America. Which do you think it was? Well, the Hausman was surprised at those words because there was a sense of a, of a freshness that was there. There was a sense of optimism that was there. There was a sense that even though there seemed to be overwhelming odds against him and so forth, this man had a, a, a bright way of looking at, at things. The helmsman asked him, he says, Admiral, what did you mean by saying that the Japanese made uh, three terrible mistakes that any attack force could make? And, and Nimitz went on to tell him, well, here are the three mistakes. 
mistake number one is the attack on Sunday morning. Almost every crewman, nine out of every ten crewmen or sailors were on shore on, on leave and so forth, and so they were not on their ships. If they had been drawn out into the ocean and then attacked and so forth, and he says, then instead of having 3,800 dead, we'd had over 38,000 dead. Mistake number two. When the Japanese attacked Battle Row, they were so excited about all these battle cruisers and, and ships all lined up in a row that they became so uh, focused on, on sinking all those ships and so forth that they failed to hit a single dry dock with a single bomb. The result of that is, is we will raise those ships that are in shallow water back to the service. With a single tugboat, we will drag them over to the dry docks and we will repair these ships. That which would have taken us forever to move them back to America to repair and to re-outfit will be done right here in this very place. Not only that, he says, I got the men to uh, man those boats once they are raised. Mistake number three. He said every ounce of fuel in the Pacific uh, theater of, of war is found five miles on the top of a mountain. A single airplane fighter could have strafed those tanks and would have destroyed all the fuel that was there, but they didn't. That's the mistake that they made. Which do you think it was? Do you think it was an enemy that was unprepared, or do you think God was on our, our side? Whether you believe that you know, the enemy wasn't quite prepared to do all that they could do, or whether you believe that God was on your side, or, or, or whatever you might think of it, Nimitz was a person who had a, was able to see a silver lining even when everyone else saw defeat and saw despair. He saw something that could be done, and so he was a man of vision. He looked at the American people, and he saw a people of, of great resolve. Thirdly, or secondly, he had a vision, not a, of a defeated Navy, but of, of a Navy that would rise from the waters of, of Pearl Harbor and would become a major effect in the world in terms of the Second World War. Thirdly, he was able to chart a path forward. He said that we will raise the boats and ships and we will bring them and we will repair them. We'll bring them over to the dry docks. We will, re, re, we will re-outfit them. And I have the men who are ready to uh, man the ships. And not only that, they're now motivated and they'll fight. And we're going to get back into this fight and we will win the war. Even today, companies and organizations, they follow the paradigm or the principle of Chester Nimitz. It's called the, the Nimitz principle, that of overcoming overwhelming odds in the face of an enemy. He knew that great things could be, be done. And I got to thinking about the Nimitz principle and so forth, and I thought to myself, you know, before there was a Nimitz principle, there were a number of other principles that could have been easily called a their principle. It could have been called the, the, the Joshua principle as he, against overwhelming odds, went up against Jericho and defeated it. Or it could have been called the Gideon Principle, who, with overwhelming odds against him, with only 300 men, he destroyed the Midianites. Or you might call it the David Principle, of overcoming overwhelming odds when you think about him as a, a young youth of a person going up against a 9-foot, 2-inch giant called Goliath, who had been trained from a, a child up to be a great warrior and so forth, and yet he was able to overcome the giant. You could have called it the Daniel principle because against overwhelming odds, uh, you know, he had everything against him when he went into the lion's den, but he came out victorious. You can go after person after person, story after story, and they'd have all one thing in common, and that is through overwhelming odds, each of them were victorious, not because the enemy made mistakes, unless it was that they made the mistake of, of God's overwhelming power or God was truly with them. I believe that God was truly with each and every one of those individuals of that, of that day. This morning, I want to introduce you to an individual who believed that principle and lived that principle in his life of being able to overcome overwhelming odds that seemed to be even against him. The surprising thing about this person is that he's somewhat of an unsung hero. Most of us don't really think a whole lot about this individual. His name is found in a, a line of over 600 names that are being chronologically laid out before God's people. It's found over in 1 Chronicles chapters 1 through, through 9. Over 600 names are there, but his name pops up as one who we remember almost, well, thousands of years later, who did an extraordinary thing because of an extraordinary trust and faith that he had in, 
in God. He was able to do a, a, an incredible thing. Uh, you, in fact, you find within this, this chronology of 600 names a, a nugget or a gold nugget, if you will, a, a principle that is set forth by a man that I believe by inspiration tells us that we can achieve, that we can overcome a lot of things when we place our trust in the right place. That we as individuals, as followers of God, that we as a congregation against overwhelming what we might call ob obstacles or, or odds are able to do great things for the Lord. I'm talking about First Chronicles, the fourth chapter, verses 9 through 10, if you'll open your Bibles to that section of Scripture. It's not very long, but it's an interesting section. Before we read it, though, let me share with you a few things as we chart our path forward for uh, 2018. The first thing I want you to know is I want you to know that, that God never meant for Christians or for congregations to be just average. I really, don't, I really believe that, that he has really designed each and every one of us for, for excellence, that he has created us for success, that he, that he wants us to live above the norm. Jesus himself said that he came that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly that it would be overflowing in terms of what we might be able to do for one another as well as for the Lord. Number four, I want you to know that each one of us are uniquely created for him and, and by him and for his purposes. And that each and every one of us uh, has a unique talent or ability that is ours. Someone said that you're one in a million. Actually, you're one in seven billion. But in reality, God has blessed you to do incredible things. Think about how Jesus refers to you and how he refers to me. He said, those who are followers of his, he says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. That tells me that we are to stand out, that we are to be different from the world that is around us, and that God has set, promised to be on our side and to be with us in whatever we might decide to accomplish or do in, in our lives. The person that I'm talking about this morning is named Jabez. And only two chapters in all the Bible are given to them, but they are rich in terms of what life really is about and how we might be able to do some incredible things. Listen to what the writer of Chronicles records for us. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him with pain. Now Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my borders and that your hand might be upon me and that you would keep me from uh, harm or evil and that you may not cause me grief or, or pain. There really is a, a small section of scripture, but in it you find an incredible principle. And so the sermon this morning is called the Jabez Principle. It's a principle about overcoming uh, odds that might be against us, being able to do incredible things for the Lord in wonderful kinds of ways. The first thing that I want you to see is that Jabez was a man of principle. When you look at what it says there, it says of Jabez that he seemed to be just a simple man. There wasn't anything extraordinary about his character or his, his person, if you will, except for to say that he is known as a man of honor. It says that he was more honorable than all of his brothers. The word honor has to do, or at least implies, the idea of integrity and honesty. That he was a person that was above the norm and that he was recognized for being so. In other words, his life was of such a degree that his life would be one of attraction and one that would draw attention. He was an honorable man. The second thing is that he had a simple name. His name was Jabez. Jabez means pain, which means of all the children that his mother bore, she said of Jabez that I brought him forth with a lot of pain. Therefore, his name shall be called Pain or Jabez. How would you like to be named that? Well, I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I was in the delivery room for all three of my daughter's births or being born. I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of pain that goes on there. I remember taking the classes on pre-birth classes. Back then, they called them Lamaze classes. And, the, and I remember the person saying, you know, when your wife is in labor and so forth, you need to hold her hand. Well, I saw the way she was grabbing hold of these grip-like things there, and I thought, I am not touching those hands. I mean, there was a lot of pain. Now, she had the children pretty fast, but there was a lot of pain involved there. And I thought she could have easily named all three of our daughters pain, pain, and pain. In fact, to some degree, they were a pain. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but, but, but his name was just 
pain, which, which, which is, is a very simple name. And, and it's almost a play on words because when you look at the last part of the 10th chapter, he says, he prays the Lord that he would, his presence would be with him and that you know, no evil would come upon him and that he would not be pained or that he would not be, be grieved. A, another point about his name is that, is that a, of faith. He's just a simple man of faith. Now, in that section of Scripture, it doesn't tell you that he was a man of, of faith, but you know he is simply because of the prayer that he offers, because the prayer that he offers is above the norm. The prayer that he offers is so important or so in incredible that this is a prayer that we're going to be talking about now for this, this time here. Certainly 2,000 years later, there, there it is. Like I said to you, there wasn't anything that was outstanding about Jabez. He seems to be an ordinary individual, except for that of his faith. He wasn't a wealthy man that we, we know of. He wasn't a, a teacher or a prophet. He wasn't a leader of a great nation of people. He's not known for, for wisdom. He's not known for his wealth. He's not known for anything in terms of a battle that he might have, have fought where he was an overwhelming victor or anything of that nature. What Jabez is known for is for his prayer and what he asked God for, and not only what he asked God for, but what God had offered to him and what God answered. So Jabez, he offers a prayer up to the God, to, which seems to be really exceptional or above the norm. And then number two, God heard his prayer, and he answered his prayer, and he gave him what he desired. Well, that brings us to us as Christians. We, too, offer up our prayers from time to time, too, don't we? The Christian, we are supposed to be praying people that our prayers would allow us to stand out uh, among those that we walk with. I mean, Paul, I think, says this over in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter and verse 17. There he says to us, pray without ceasing. And Jesus in Matthew, the seventh chapter, he says, listen, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. So there's the idea that as Christians, we're to be those who are asking and seeking and knocking and that we are to be expecting good things to come from the Lord because he wants to do good things for us. He wants us to be successful in life. He wants us to live the abundant life. God wants you to have the very best. And that's why he says, if you ask for a fish, he's not going to give you a stone. If you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a snake. He's going to give you exactly what you need in, in your life. And so, and so there's a secret about prayer. If you're like me, you know, when I pray, uh, you know, sometimes I'm hesitant about praying. Sometimes I'm hesitant because, well, am I being selfish about this? Am I asking for things that maybe I, I really don't need? Or, or it might be that I'm thinking to myself, should I pray this? And do I really believe that God can work in my life in this area? Maybe you're the same kind of, of person. But here's what I've learned about prayer. There's a secret about prayer when it comes to asking God for things, and that's this. If you ask God for things that he already wants you to have or wants to, to give you, then it's not selfish. If God already wants to give you those things that you have asked for, then it's not self-centered. And it is not wrong to do so. God wants to ha give us the best. God wants us to live the abundant life. God wants us to pray. And I believe that's why, by inspiration, the prayer of Jabez and his principle for living life is recorded for us so that we might be able to chart our path forward as individual Christians so that we as a congregation might chart our path forward to do great things for the Lord. So we're talking about a principle. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 says this, Call to me and I will answer you. That's God's promise to us. You call, I will answer. You say, but you know, I'm not sure I should do that. Well, listen, let me tell you something when it comes to God. God is very capable of saying no to your prayers. He can say no. He can say, you know, wait. But he can also say yes to your prayers. And Jabez becomes that perfect example of one who was listened to. And so there is a principle of charting the path forward as individual Christians and as a congregation that will help us to live above the normal or normalcy and not live lives of mediocrity. God intends that forward. And so we're going to look at the Jabez principle and his prayer life. And the first thing that we're going to notice is, number one, is he asked God to bless him. That's what he does. Jabez, you see, sought a blessing. Maybe he can remember back to Abraham, you know, that great patriarch that God says, listen, I'm, you know, you need the land in which you are going. I'm going to send you on a new path. There's a new chart that's pa path for you, but I'm going to bless you. And not only am I going to bless you, but all nations are going to be blessed because of you. 
And so Jabez sought a blessing from God so that he might become a blessing to others. In fact, I would submit to you that that's really what we are about. Life is not just about us as individuals. Life does not revolve just around us. What the Bible does say is that some of the whole reason, or at least part of the whole reason for our existence is to be, a, number one, a blessing to God, and then to be a blessing to the world or to others that is around us. And that's, that's really it. If you don't believe me, all you have to look at Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 40, you can call it a lot of things. You can talk about being the passion of God or resolutions or, or whatever, but certainly the principle of what God being first and others being second is, is certainly there. What is the greatest commandment in the law? A lawyer asked Jesus, and he says, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. What are we here for? We're here to love God and to bless him. Number two, a second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. We are here to be a blessing to others. And so, you know, so Jabez, he prays to God, uh, God, if you would be a blessing or give me a blessing in order that I might be able to bless those who are around me. When you talk about prayer, there are, you know, there are a number of motives for prayer. There's a right motive for prayer, and there is a wrong motive for prayer. Let me talk to you some about the right motives for prayer. It's not wrong to pray for wealth. Now, generally, you know, mankind, we struggle a lot with money and so forth. It's one of the top two most talked about uh, subjects in all the scripture is money and the misuse of money. But it's not wrong to pray for wealth if you're wanting to help others, if you're wanting to be a blessing to others, if you're wanting to use it to, you know, to bless another person's life in terms of outreach or doing mission work or things of that nature, in order that you might be a blessing to others, it's not wrong to pray for wealth if you're going to use it for the right kinds of, of things. It's not wrong to pray for wisdom. If you want the wisdom in order that you might be able to help others in their lives, if you're able to give them good you know, advice and counsel in their lives, it would not be wrong to pray for wisdom. In fact, James, the first chapter in verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously without holding anything back. So it's not wrong to pray for wisdom if we're going to use it to help other individuals. It's not even wrong to pray for a new church building that we have that we're, you know, we're planning on possibly building one day off there over on Eustick and so forth. It's not wrong to pray for a new building if we're going to use it as a tool in order to reach out to those who are lost and bring people in and give people room to sit together with one another and give us more room so that we can expand the borders of the kingdom and to grow forth. So it's not wrong to pray for a new building. So when are prayers wrong? What's the wrong motives for prayer? Well, it's wrong to pray for wealth if all you want to do is use your wealth on yourself. If you just want to buy more stuff and, and more things just for yourself, then I would probably say to you that your prayer is not going to be answered. It's not wrong to pray for wisdom. Uh, or it's wrong to pray for wisdom if you think that, you know, by asking for wisdom, I'm going to be smarter than anyone else in the room here, and I'll be able to show off and be able to really, you know, impress people by how wise I am or, or how smart I am. Then that would be a wrong ma ma uh, a motive, and I doubt your prayer is going to be answered. Or it would be wrong to pray for a new church building. If all we want is a church building so we can say, look, we have arrived. Look how big our church building is. Look how, what, look how successful we are as a congregation. Listen, if that's the reason why we're going to build a church building, then I would suggest to you that I doubt God is going to answer our prayers in that area. So there's wrong motives and there are right motives for prayer. And my, my belief is that if our motives are right, then there are no limits to what we might ask of, of God and what he is capable of, of giving. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless me. He wants us, to, he wants to bless our congregation so that we can be a blessing to others in our lives. So Jabez's first principle is, is, is to ask for a, a blessing. If you're going to want, if you're wanting to bless God and to bless others, then the chances are God is going to answer your prayer. Number two, he prayed for more. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my borders. Or I think some translation says, enlarge my territories. Others say, uh, help me go out to the coast and, and so forth. Basically, what he's asking is just enlarge the territory. Make it bigger. That's what I am asking uh, of you. The message says, give me land, uh, large tracts of land. I mean, really enlarge things. Really make things really, really big. And so, so Jabez, he's not interested in maintaining the status quo. 
He's not interested in remaining the same. He wants to grow. He wants to move forward. He's interested in doing that in his, his life. And that's what we're to be about as well. He wasn't asking for something that was selfish. He's not being self-centered. He's saying, listen, enlarge my territory. Expand my borders. If that's what you want, if that's what God wants, then that's what God will want for you, and that's what Jabez is going to ask for. So what happens when we pray like this? What happens when Jabez prays like this? Well, here's what I think happens. What happens is we take the limits off of God. Oftentimes what we do is we box God in according to our abilities, according to our talents, according to our education, our training, our finances, and things of that nature. And we walk little by faith and a whole lot by, by sight. But when you pray like this, you take the limits off of God. You broaden the borders. You begin to think outside the box in incredible kinds of, of ways. Don't limit God by putting him in a box. Think of everything outside the box. Or everything outside the the circle of what God is able to do in, in, in our lives. Too often what we do as individuals, or maybe even as a congregation, is we say to the Lord, whether we are big or whether we are a small, small congregation, we see a project that is out there, a vision that is out there, something that is incredible for us to do, that seems as though the, the odds are against us, that it's overwhelming in accomplishing it and so forth, and we say to ourselves, you know, we would like to really do that, Lord, but you know, we only have this much of talent. We only have this much ability. We only have this much finance and so forth. And so we just don't have the resources. So we can't, we just can't do it. And instead of taking giant leaps of, and steps of faith, we end up taking baby steps in, in faith. I'm here to say to you that when you talk about people like Joshua or Moses or, or, or Gideon, or Samson, or David, or any of those people in the Bible. Why do you think they're recorded there so we can have nice stories to tell our children? They're recorded there to show you that God is a big God, that he's bigger than our abilities, that he's bigger than our talents, that he's bigger than our bank accounts, that he's a big God. And he simply says, you ask and let me decide what I'm able to do for you. Don't limit me. There's a king who had a, an individual in his kingdom who had done something incredible, obviously, and the result is the king said to the man, he says, listen, he goes, you decide what you want in the kingdom and I will give it to you. And the man takes his staff out and he draws a circle around himself. And the king says to him, he says, is that all you want? Is that which is inside the circle? And the man says, no, I want everything outside the circle. Well, that's what God is saying to us. Listen, it's like saying to God, here is a blank check you fill out what you think we need. That takes an incredible amount of faith to trust God with the checkbook and with a blank check and knowing that he can do incredible things for us when we put our trust completely in him. Jabez says, God, bless me. Enlarge my borders. Expand my territory. And he believed God was going to be able to do that in his life. And so we need to not be you know, limited by the box or the circle, we need to think outside the box. That little thing on the left me of that tic-tac-toe thing, it says, thinking outside the box, I cut off the part, it says, that's called cheating. <laughs> no, it's called faith. It's called faith. When we think outside the box with God with us and on our side, we can do incredible things for him. So Jabez looked beyond uh, where he was and what he could do to where God was and what God could do, and he entrusted him with his prayer. Here's the next principle. He prayed for God's presence with him. Listen to what he said. That your hand might be with me, that you will bless me, O God, that you will enlarge my territory or my borders, that you will expand it, and that your hand might be with me. In other words, he's praying that God's presence would be with him in whatever he did. Some would say, well, you know, he's talking about God's grace, or he's talking about God's love, or God's kindness, or God's compassion, or opportunity. It could be that all those principles are there. If we need to be expanded in terms of our love for one another, if we need to be expanded in terms of our compassion for one another, our kindness for one another, if we need to be expanded so that we have eyes to look at the opportunities that are before us, then that's a good thing. But the context seems to at least imply, certainly to lay down the idea that, that Jabez, he wasn't asking for those things. He is asking for territory. 
He is asking for land. Lord, expand my borders. Expand the land. Expand it for me. I'll be a blessing to you. I'll be a blessing to others if you will do that. But here's what we do. What we do as individuals, and we think about God's presence being with us, is that we do the, 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 the math and the reasoning in our minds of what God can do and what he can't do. And here's how human reasoning oftentimes looks at things. We say to ourselves, my abilities plus my experience plus my training plus my finances equals expanding the territory. That's how we look at, at things. That's how we reason about things, and that's how we oftentimes pray about things. But God's reasoning is different than ours. He doesn't think the way we think. God's reasoning is something like this. My willingness and weakness, that's you and me, my willingness and weakness plus God's will and supernatural power equals my expanded territory. It's putting our trust into God. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is look back at the hand of God working in our congregation probably six, seven years ago. We were looking for land to purchase in order to build upon. Everything that we looked at was in the millions and millions of dollars to, to find. We saw, found a plot of land over off of Eustick up here, tin, tin, or Black Cat and, and Eustick. And when we first looked at that property, the property was around $1.6, $1.8 million is what they wanted for it. Guess what we bought it for? We bought it for 200000 Now, let me ask you, was that God? Did the bank make a mistake? Banks don't make mistakes like that, by the way. But God's hand can do some incredible things. And so we bought that piece of land for next to nothing compared to what it's almost that exact same price today is what it's worth now. God can do incredible things. I stood before you not, that, not even a month ago and said to you, I'm going over to Cameroon. I'm wanting to do some mission work there. I'm wanting to put roofs on buildings. We're wanting to help in medical supplies. We want to help an orphanage. We want to do this. We want to do that. And I laid out a bunch of things for you, and I said, just give as you think the, the need is there. Do you know what you guys gave? You guys gave over $16,000. And more's come in. That's a lot of money. I was talking to Lori about that last night, and I said, you know, I remember at the beginning of this, I told her, I said, I've waited too late to, to announce this to the congregation, and I, and I hope that we're able to get enough money to at least pay those preachers and, and to help that orphanage. And all I can do now is look at that and say, man, God's hand was in that, because we'll be able to do some incredible things there for the Lord. I'm simply saying is that sometimes we can't trust in our own reasoning when it comes down to doing great things for God, but realize that we have and serve a great God who can do incredible things for us. The best ability is availability, and next after that is dependability, is putting our trust in God. When it comes to what is beyond our abilities and talents and finances, well, you know, that's where having faith in God and praying that the hand of God will help us to overcome what we might consider to be overwhelming odds if we'll just ask him for it. If we'll just trust him for it. When God's hand is upon us, we need not be afraid. Moses wasn't afraid. Joshua wasn't afraid. Gideon, David, Samson, the 12 apostles. Okay, when I say afraid, I'm not saying that these guys were not humans and that they didn't see the obstacles and the things that were there. But they were able to move past their fear to that of, of faith because they placed their hands in the hands of God and entrusted him. And we are here today because of their faith and what they, they did for us. Jabez also prayed for protection, that you would keep me from evil. I think some translators say, keep me from harm, or that you may not grieve me, or that you may not pain me. So what is he talking about there? Well, there's a number of things that came in, in my mind. I think that he might be talking about protection from the naysayers. Those who are going to be negative or pessimistic about what he would be able to accomplish. Lord, expand my lands. And the people around him say, you can't expand land. You don't have the resources to expand land. You can't do that. You're asking God for too much. You're being selfish. You're being self-centered. Maybe you're wrong about this prayer. But Jabez, he doesn't listen to the negativity. He doesn't listen to the naysayers. He doesn't listen to those who are pessimistic. You know, when I was 24 years old, about 25 years old, I was making a lot of money in my secular job. 
really was for the 1970-79. I was you know, a 24-year-old guy. I had my house that I was buying. I had a truck, had a motorcycle, had a car, a bunch of junk like that. Making about 70000 a year for, for just a little peep squeak of a guy and so forth. And I decided to quit my job, sell my house, sell my motorcycle, sell my truck, and keep a car and move to Dallas, Texas to become a preacher. And they told me, now, when you come to school here, you can't bring a lot of money with you. And so, in fact, what you're going to live on is you're going to live on $800 a month. 460 of that went for a house. Another part went for the utilities, and that which was left over went to tuna fish casseroles and beanie weenie casseroles and things like that. Had three children there. Had two children when we went. Had one while we were there. Three children in, in all. When I was getting ready to go to school, I can't tell you how many people came up to me saying, you're making a mistake, Richard. You're making a mistake. You're not going to be able to live without that kind of money. You're not going to be able to get into a house for a long time if you do this. You're going to have a hard time recouping. They don't pay preachers a lot of money. You better be careful about this decision. Well, you know what? That was okay. I went anyway. And here I am today. I got a house. got a car. Don't have a motorcycle. Lori won't let me have one. You know? <laughs> but my life has been blessed over abundantly. Beyond what I, God has so expanded my territory and my borders in my life spiritually as well as physically speaking. We need to trust God. They can do incredible things for us and not allow a lot of negativity or pessimism or, you know, just naysayers say, you can't do this. When we get ready to do things as our congregations, let's pray to God and pray believing that God is able to do some great things. So some final thoughts about charting a, a path forward and the sermon will be yours. Number one, what would you pray for? Seriously, you think about this. What would you pray for if you knew that you could not fail? If you believe that God is able, what would you play, pray for? God can't fail you. You're going to make it. What would you pray for? Number two, what have you dreamed about but dismissed because you thought it was an impossible dream? What have you thought about, dreamed about, but you've just dismissed it? Because you said, you know what? Odds are against me. I'm not going to be able to do this. What would you pray for? Let's begin to pray for God's hand to be upon our life in our congregation. God's a big God. God can say yes. God can say no. He can say wait. But let's trust him with the answer. And let's not make the answers for him. Let's be people of, of faith who launch out. Let's, let's pray for something big and and important that when it comes true, we'll say, you know, this has to be the hand of God. It could not have been done any other way unless he was behind it. Let's trust him with big things and see if God can't bless us because of it. The Jabez principle. Who was Jabez? Did I tell you that Jabez was just an ordinary guy? Did I tell you that, that he wasn't a great king of a great nation? That he, did, he wasn't the hero of some great big battle like Joshua or, or Samson or anything like that. He wasn't a wealthy man, from what we can tell. Uh, he wasn't a person that had more wisdom than anyone else or more ability. Jabez had faith. Jabez's principle was this. Have faith in God, entrust to him, and see if God won't do something great for your life. When he prayed that, God gave him land. He didn't ask for a hundred acres. He didn't ask for a thousand acres. He didn't ask for a million acres. He asked God, expand my territory. You decide what it's going to be. And God did. Didn't say that he deserved it. Didn't say that God couldn't give him more than what he already gave him, but it did say that he gave him what he asked for. And what he got asked for and what he got was enough. And he praised God for it, I'm sure. And so let me encourage you to practice the Jabez principle as we go into 2018 in your individual life and then in the congregation's life and see if God doesn't do something great in your life so big that you'll say to yourselves, you know what, this had to be the hand of God. There's no other way this could have happened than he was behind this. So the message is yours. Your response is yours. If you have a desire that you'd like to become a Christian this morning, uh, then this would be the time that you'd make that known. Or if maybe you're a Christian and maybe you've kind of strayed away, then maybe now is the time to recommit. And if you'd like us to pray with you and for you, then we'd count that a privilege. Whatever your need is, once you come on together, we stand and sing and give you opportunity.